Yep, so hi everyone. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Christopher Madden to present at our CIC lecture series today. Dr. Madden is an assistant professor at the University of Nottingham in the UK. He completed his PhD studies at the University of Alberta with Drs. Marsha Spech, Jeremy Kaplan, and Esther Fujiwara, primarily studying memory and decision making using cognitive psychology and neuroimaging methods. He then moved to Boston College where he conducted his postdoctoral research with Dr. Elizabeth Kessinger. He's developed novel approaches to study um, structural brain metrics, namely fractal dimensionality and cell comorphometry, which greatly complements the neuroimaging metrics we're familiar with, such as cortical thickness or surface area. Um, I was really fascinated with his approach because it allows us to fully understand the underlying heterogeneity of the brain um, using these different neuroimaging metrics. Indeed, since completing his PhD, he has expanded his research interest to use these novel approaches to understand brain structure with age, which will be the focus of his talk today. Dr. Madden has asked that if you have questions, feel free to ask throughout the talk, or you can type your question in the chat box and I can ask for you. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it off to Dr. Madden. So yeah, great. Thank you all for coming and thank you for the kind introduction. So I will tell you some stuff I've been doing with novel brain measures. Hopefully you can't hear outside sounds too much. I live by a busy road. Um, so yeah, as, as has been mentioned, my original kind of background and training is in cognitive psychology and specifically looking at memory and decision-making. That's not what I'm gonna be talking about today, but if you're interested in that sort of work, here are some papers that I've done before. You can look those up later on. That's not what I'm gonna be talking about though. Um, so looking at brain structure and aging is something I kind of came into in my postdoc where the lab that I was working in did aging work, but didn't really do the structural brain morphology stuff, which I ended up kind of being a tangent and then being a whole line of research for me. A lot of the stuff that I, I do with in this kind of direction uses open access brain imaging resources that effectively all other people collect from the data. I'm just trying to do something new with it that at least informs the field and, and we can learn something from. Um, for today's the studies I'll be talking about, Primarily, it'll be based on this one called ICSI that's in this kind of upper left here and on OASIS, but other studies that are kind of maybe mentioned in tangents, but otherwise there are published papers that you could look up, um, use some of these other data sets as well as others that I couldn't find good logos for or just didn't feel like updating the slide. But the main two are from over there. So getting into more of the actual substance of this, the idea is to at least primarily have been looking at age related differences in brain structure, but the overall principles and the measures we're using here apply to any kind of any kind of participant group that you can have a kind of a continuous measure or or groups or some level of looking at inter individual differences. So with aging, what we tend to find is cortical thinning differences in gyrification where that get, ends up being lower for older adults, subcortical volume shrink, ventricles enlarge. And if you look at two MRIs, sometimes I would try and make this more interactive, but effectively the person on the right is an older adult and the one on the left, kind of more center of the slide, that would be a relatively younger adult by a lot. So I think it's a 20 year old and an 80 year old. Um, so it's obviously then also cross-sectional relative to what I'm showing here. So these are some things that we know already that are relatively well established in the field. But what, what else can we tell from these structures that maybe we can learn something new? So if we think of these measures for now, I'm focusing more on, on cortex specifically. So a lot of these common measures are effectively measures of volume, like we can look Look at literally cortical gray matter volume, or we can look at that a little bit with a bit more precision and think of well, we have cortical thickness, and we can have, and at least here we'll look at kind of cortical surface area, but those still are volumetric in terms of they're related to the size of things. So those are the main conventional measures that that the field kind of has been using. There is still a reasonable amount of work, but much smaller, looking at a measure that's called gyrification, and in a moment I'll tell you a little bit more about how we actually measure that, but the idea is just generally how folded is the brain. And then again, that's a thing we can compare across individuals. So 
part of this approach and using these open access data sets and, and overall here is not to require anything special in the acquisition. So center T1 volume, preferably I'll say one millimeter isotropic. That's all you need to do any of the stuff that I'm really going to be describing now. So for instance, with other, let's say if someone was looking at hippocampal subfields, then having a T2 volume and having higher in-plane resolution is, is at least definitely preferable. But the stuff that I'm focusing on here, you can do with relatively coarse kind of minimal imaging. If you don't have a standard T1 for the participants, I'm not really sure what else you would have, or at least that's a good thing you should have collected alongside if you're doing, let's say, an fMRI study. So it's probably data that you might have anyway, and we're kind of just ignoring in the focus on, of, say, fMRI. But you do still need to have a reasonable sample size to do these types of analyses, as you're effectively only using one volume per person in at least, I'll say, most cases. So if we look at that, we again have our young adult and our older adult. I've already kind of showed you, I think, these exact same images. So what, what else can we tell here? Well, we can tell there's a lot more space between, I guess, effectively the boundaries of the, the skull and the brain for the older adult. The ventricles are enlarging. Those are quite prominent. Cortical thickness, you can't really tell just by eye because it is a difference that's in fractions of millimeters, at least depending on what kind of ages you're comparing. But that is a lot less obvious in terms of just looking at the image and seeing what are age-related changes. But there is something that's, that is changing here in terms of, let's say, the folding, where it's not as kind of tightly packed in terms of the, the cortical folding with aging. So let's, let's talk about how we actually measure gyrification. So here is a hemisphere of, cor of cortex. And this we can measure the surface area of. Again, that's a relatively conventional measure. But what if we were to effectively kind of, in a simulation sense, wrap around a smooth surface that kind of goes around it, it can have some um, kind of dips into the, the folds based on how the actual shape is. So it's not a full convex hull. There's, there is kind of effectively a smoothing parameter in terms of how tightly to wrap around it. But the idea is to kind of bridge across diorite and have a smooth surface that's effectively the same size and would fit inside the same kind of cavity as where the brain is, but doesn't have any of the folding. And then we can compare these two in terms of their surface area and say, what is the surface area for the actual brain relative to the smooth surface? On average, it's somewhere around three-ish, like across the whole brain. Um, that's how gyrified human brains are. But again, we're, all, we're more interested in, in the inter-individual differences. This can also be done locally, where you kind of have a disc that wraps around a section of the brain, but still the same idea of a smooth surface wrapping around the otherwise very folded brain. And we can see how folded it is, in this case now, a region, um, which again is what we're calling a gyrification index. So in this 2016 paper, so I guess it's getting a bit old now, but I will tell you about some more recent research in this talk as well. Um, first, I started with just the unparcellated cortical ribbon. So you can't tell from the figure, but the idea is that that's hollowed out. So they're, we're only looking at the cortical gray matter. If we look at cortical thickness, this is from the ICSI data set. And this is a partial correlation removing effect, the effects of, of sex, at least if there are any. Or, there wasn't really a statistical test that it was more of just removing an, an potential kind of other source of variance. And it trends downwards, but it's not that great of a relationship. So again, this is across the whole brain. This that We know there's heterogeneity in cortical thickness, but this is just average cortical thickness across the whole brain. It trends downwards, but also there's a lot of off-axis variability. So for instance, someone in their 20s still could have comparable cortical thickness to someone in their 70s. So we just took like one of these data points and went straight across. They'd be on the low end for one of those distributions, high end for the other, but they're still kind of within that range. So in terms of precision or kind of individual data points, it's not that great, but the, on a cohort level, that is a, a, a measure that we have that very robustly does relate to, to age-related differences. We can go for a little bit more precision and look at lobes. 
for the sake of this section of the talk, I'm only going to that level of precision because it was useful enough for some of the, the novel measures that I will be getting to that are effectively part of the same paper. So we can see that all of these trend downward, but more, more pronounced in some than others. We also can see that there's average differences in cortical thickness. So for instance, the frontal lobe just on average has higher cortical thickness than say the occipital lobe. But we can also see that the occipital lobe is less age affected than the frontal lobe and to some degree also the temporal lobe in blue. So some regions are more affected than others. Again, we probably should do this with greater precision. Others have, and I guess I also have in, in more recent paper th than this, but the point was just to show there is some variance between regions. We can also look at then the gyrification as I just described the smooth surface that I guess the average here is a little bit lower than three, but how folded is the brain compared to the smooth surface? We can do it first on the whole brain level. It trends downward, but this effect is, actually, is quite weak and there's even more off axis variability. We can also look at that lobe wise. And here I found at least the thing that I, was, I have found quite interesting and was kind of surprised at the time is that the region, again, on a very kind of coarse low bar level, the region that's the most affected by age is the parietal lobe here. I don't know necessarily if that statistically would come up as more like a stronger correlation than the other ones, but this has been shown in other studies that have more robust methods that looked at things more vertex wise across the whole surface of the brain. So this paper is a couple of years earlier than uh, otherwise has been shown as this 2016 paper, but shows that gyrification effects are most pronounced in kind of the superior, superior parietal lobule that's where it's kind of affected with the darkest purple. Whereas cortical thickness, which unfortunately has a different color mapping kind of scheme there, that's more pronounced in the frontal and to some degree, I guess let's say superior temporal, but the very temporal and not really in the parietal lobe. So I found it quite interesting that these have different spatial kind of topo topographical profiles. Um, so that's something that's at least worth future research to kind of explore more. Potentially this is suggesting that there's differences in the, in the kind of ch neurobiological changes related to aging that result in different topologies here. It's topographies, sorry. Um, but that needs some more thinking in terms of how to even best measure what could be causing these in a more well, mechanistic approach. But again, different topographies that we did replicate here. Now, the real measure of interest for this 2016 paper, though, is a measure called fractal dimensionality. So there is a version of this figure in this 2016 paper. What I'm showing you now is a better visualization that I've made since that will go in a future paper. But the, the principle is the same as that 2016 paper. So first we say at, let's say, our acquisition um, resolution of one millimeter isotropic, how many voxels are cortical gray matter? And we'll get some number for that. Then we downsample our image and say at, let's say two millimeter isotropic, how many voxels at that respective resolution? So it'll be a smaller number, but how much smaller, probably a little bit thinking to figure out how much, but we'll, it's not really a thing we need to model. It's a thing we will measure anyway. How many voxels at two millimeter isotropic have cortical gray matter or in general, whatever region looking at, but that's still the focus for now. Then we can do this again for four, mill four millimeter isotropic, basically just going up in powers of two and then eight. And then I would do 16, but it looks a little bit silly for that figure. So I'm not showing that one there. And we can see here are our counts. So one millimeter isotropic for this particular individual, there's just over half a million voxels. Yeah. Um, and almost 100,000 at two millimeter isotropic and at 16 millimeter isotropic, we have just short of 500 voxels. So at our different resolutions, now we have a characterization of how big is it. But the main thing here is that we're looking across different spatial scales. We don't really care about these numbers themselves. What we care about is if we log transform in base two, because that's what we're using here out anyway, and I guess that's convention here. If we log transform both of these, and I make the y-axis negative which I think is, well, and effectively I make it so it counts up, um, such that it's a slope that goes upward, which 
just makes it a little bit easier to interpret. And the slope of that line then is our fractal dimensionality. I have a little subscript F there because I'm using what I call the filled volume there. So I could hollow out or only consider the edge voxels of our cortical gray matter in this case. And you'll get a slightly different number because you're effectively including the inside voxels are not in your count. So that does give you different numbers. Um, but short version is in the paper, I did both the filled and the surface, like the fractal dimensionality of this hollowed out version and the filled one has a stronger age related effect. So it doesn't always necessarily be the one that you'll use, but that's worked out as the stronger effect thus far. So here we have this across different spatial scales measure of effectively how much are we losing precision in our, in our structure. If we started with something like just a giant cube or a giant sphere or something without nuance in its overall structure like we have in this in cortical folding, then we would end up having a shallower slope. We won't be losing as much in our count as we go across resolutions. And then that would tell us that that structure is less complex. So that's our measure of fractal dimensionality. And if we use this across our unparcelated cortical ribbon now for a, a sample and not just an individual, we see that this trends downward and seems to have a bit stronger of an effect than we were finding with either thickness or gyrification. This measure is correlated with both thickness and gyrification. And for instance, if we looked at the effect of cortical thickness on age and I did a partial correlation controlling for fractal dimensionality, those effects, those previous effects end up disappearing. But the opposite is not true. If we look at fractal dimensionality and control for thickness and gyrification and see if there's any relationship with age, it does have additional variability beyond what is accounted for by, again, these more conventional measures. If we look across lobes, those correlations are stronger than anything we had with thickness or gyrification. So that's at least quite useful. We can go to higher levels of precision than just lobe level. But if you do get to too small of a region, then there isn't really complexity in the st structure left. So you can't go too small. So that is a consideration. But in later papers, I did look at smaller regions than four lobes. Yeah. Um, if we look at some of the brains just on the whole cortical gray matter level, so not parcelating anything, and say, let's look at in that distribution what do the surfaces look like for some of them that were relatively high versus some of them that were relatively low in complexity. And in general, I think you'd kind of, at least someone with some background knowledge at least, would agree that this looks like a young adult and this looks like an old adult for the lower complexity. And you can see that's the, the packing of the folding seems to go down with the low complexity set. So it seems to kind of check out at least visually then as well that it is picking up on something that seems to be meaningful, does seem to be a, a difference in the structure that is, is sensitive to, that generally is something that we'd otherwise also associate with aging. So that's all, all promising. Now to effectively take all those scatter plots I showed you and view them in a kind of summary way, here I'm plotting the R squared with age for each of these measures. So effectively, if you took the partial correlation that I showed earlier and squared them. But I also, I believe in this included quadratic effects, not just linear ones. So we have a little bit more than just if you were to square those numbers. So for thickness and gyrification, we have reasonable associations between those respective measures at cortical gray matter level with age, with complexity, which is our fractal dimensionality here. We're doing quite a bit better. For thickness and gyrification, as I pointed out earlier, Thickness effects are most pronounced in the frontal and temporal lobes. Gyrification is most pronounced by a slight margin in the parietal lobe. Whereas with complexity, it's just doing better across all of that. So that's kind of at least the first take home message of sorts is that this fractal dimensionality measure seems to be quite useful, at least in certain contexts. You have hopefully some understanding of what it is. And if you were to try using this, you could try making your own method, but you could use the one that I made instead. Maybe as a validation, you could still try testing it to see um, you know, how well you understand it if you were to try using it, because that's generally a good thing. But it's also good to share. Here's a toolbox that is designed to work with the output files from FreeSurfer. So it 
already knows that folder structure and which files to use. And there's some documentation there. And it'll just go with that. If you have some other volumes, just like in a nifty file and otherwise kind of dummy coded for different brain regions, there's some notes and then kind of code that you can integrate with something else to, to make it loop through and, and work on that. Uh, Chris, we just yep. have a question from Malar. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, can you, I just maybe have two questions. One would be, can you maybe give us, uh, I'm, I'm struggling a bit to figure out like what does the measure capture, right? So what, like, what does complexity mean in this region? So is it really just a notion of kind of like the tightness of the packing? And so if you were to, if you were to use a measure like intracircal space, would that, would that give you something? So it's more fine grained than that. So it's more about the actual, like, I guess later I'll give you a bit of an example with some cortical structures, but like the texture and bumpiness and, and other more nuances of the shape of it also are getting captured. And I guess a, a bigger picture question is really, what is it capturing in a more comprehensible way, like in terms of interpretation, like we have thickness, we have clarification, what is it really capturing is to some degree an open question. It seems to do good as a mathematical approach, but what is it biologically kind of really capturing in terms of a property of it is not fully understood. Okay. And, and then I guess my other question was, you know, you're, you're mentioning that this is kind of a, a useful approach above and beyond cortical thickness or surface area, for example, or gyrification, right? So you mentioned the Toro paper, which gives you kind of these vertex wise estimates of local folding, right? right? So in this particular case, would you have, you know, a similar vertex wise measure? Cause here you're, you're showing lobular measure. So there are issues of again if you go to, like if you think of it like as on cortical gray matter you just had like a small patch like this little like a square there and a corresponding square on the gray white gray matter white matter kind of surface so you have kind of a truncated pyramid then the, you don't have any complexity to capture anymore it needs to have more of the context of what that what is the folding or is properties of the complexity around that region so with the lobes, I just basically truncate it, per, pretend the rest of the brain is not there, and say, give me the complexity of this removed kind of section of structure. But doing it on smaller scales gets problematic. So for instance, you can do it on the, on the DKT atlas, which has um, 68, 3, 62, 62 oh, yeah. um, regions of parcellation. The Destro atlas is, at least some of those are too small. I have made a remapping where I basically collapse some of the smaller regions together, like the insula gets divided into six different parcellations. I just group all of those. Some of the inferior um, frontal gyres I grouped together, and then I brought that from the 148 down to 84. And those, that still I think does work. So it does end up being an issue of how localized you do it. One thing I have been working on is a, a trying to do it more vertex-wise, but still instead of just doing it on that kind of removed structure like I have been thus far is more to make a box around the region at different scales and then attribute that to the middle voxel and then do that kind of searchlight-ish approach. Mm -hmm. Computationally, well, like from that cortical gray matter figure I showed earlier, there's let's say half a million. So I have to do the computation a whole lot of times. Um, so it might want to be something even more so on a cluster than you might like here, I'd probably do it anyway, but that, it honestly just takes seconds. Um, so there's at least things to think about on what scale is useful. And also then maybe not doing it all the way up to let's say the 16, 16 millimeter isotropic box, if the thing you actually care about is much smaller. So there are some considerations in terms of how scale works with this. But the main thing is if there's kind of coarseness in the structure, like there's edges and like little folds and stuff, it's capturing those properties. Whereas if you kind of smooth that stuff out, you get a lower complexity. Okay. So like texture like things, but also larger scale things like the overall gyrification, it is capturing both of those. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And Chris, sorry, just one more question actually for me. I was, I was wondering um, how do you like, cause I, I feel like cortical thickness and for example, surface area, they, they are like independent measures, but then how do you account for the fact that like, it seems to me like FD is also comprising in part 
cortical thickness, for example, and that's accounting for greater like the greater variance that we're seeing across the lobes. Like it, it doesn't seem like truly independent of the other neuroimaging phenotypes I that don't we measure. I think measured. it is. Like I, oh. I agree. It is not independent. <laughs> yeah. I guess I accept that and think of it as it is a complex measure that's picking up different sources of variance. Mm -hmm. And I guess if at the very least, if the goal is to see how much does fractal dimensionality give above the other ones, then then use a partial correlation or like a hierarchical regression and see what is additional that it gives up the other things don't. Right. But it is a complex aggregate measure. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So I will continue with slides now. So I've obviously been here using it with with aging, and that ended up apparently being something that was novel. Um, but it has been actually used with Alzheimer's a whole bunch of years before. So this is from a 2010 paper, so over technically over a decade ago now. Um, using data from ADNI, I believe it's only 35 controls on 35 Alzheimer's patients. So looking at whole brain cortical thickness and gyrification, there are statistical differences between the, the patient group and the controls. But if you looked at fractal dimensionality, then, well, there the, the intervals don't even overlap anymore. So that, I guess you could look into how were they selected and other things that are probably relevant to kind of interpret this overall. but at least on some level, the point of this figure, at least, is to show that this measure is better at segregating Alzheimer's patients from controls and effectively has more sensitivity to that the kind of disease severity or disease status than conventional measures do. Um, this is just as a little bit of an aside. So this is from a paper where I looked at aging and did kind of machine learning and tried to compare these measures and see how well things work. But part of the background review that I did that's also in that paper was looking at just the variety of different factors that can influence estimates of brain morphology. And then the idea is just all of these things influence brain structure or our estimates of it, which is also why I included the scan related factors. So all of these things are things that affect the 3D volume that we're then deriving things from. and trying to see where fractal dimensionality may or may not be more useful than these conventional measures is to some degree an open question within this that is at least there's a lot of things there. I'm not gonna try and study all of them, but is a kind of broad direction of where this goes. If you're interested in the fractal dimensionality stuff, this is a recent paper that I did work, working with Ian McDonough and a sample that he's been collecting in his lab where we looked more at the relationship between fractal dimensionality with aging, but also more so in relation also to cognitive measures. The analyses here are a bit complicated and I'm just gonna go, with, I'm not gonna go through that here. That could have been a whole other talk, but if you're interested in this, this might be another thing to kind of look into afterwards. I will go into a bit of an aside now about subcortical structures uh, and not just focus on the cortex. So that cortex was in the title, but also let's say as uh, someone interested in memory and decision making and emotion processing, a lot of subcortical structures are relevant to those things. I guess so is the cortex, but I'm not by any means going to limit myself just looking at cortical. It was more of a focus for the sake of giving the talk some focus. But the idea should be if there's some difference in the in the volume of us, especially I would say a subcortical structure, shouldn't we also affect there to be some difference in the shape? So for instance, with aging, if we think there are going to be differences in hippocampal volume, is it just that it's the same shape and it's kind of scaling down to be smaller? Like how does how does that work? And fractal dimensionality is one way to get some more insight into that. Like you should independently kind of be estimating volume as well. But if something else is changing in the shape in a systematic way, in terms of across inter-individually with as a function of aging then this should give us better sensitivity than volume alone would. And indeed, this does give us better sensitivity than volume alone does. So in this 2017 paper, I looked across the seven subcortical regions that get segmented by free surfer and looked at volume and fractal dimensionality and did some comparisons to see how much more some regions were getting um, age-related effects being explained by fractal dimensionality than volume. <clears throat> 
And then in the follow-up paper, some are going in the direction of trying to see more towards what, like, say, Malari's question of what's it really picking up on. That was more kind of oriented initially there about cortex. But here, I started with it here because I thought it would be easier to approach. So the cortical kind of equivalent I'm still working on. But the subcortical, here I tried to kind of derive some other more interpretable measures than fraction dimensionality and see how those relate to volume and fraction dimensionality and each other and come up with some other measures of shape that, that are easier to understand. So the four that I came up with were the ratio of surface area to volume. So effectively how compact is a structure versus kind of more packed in like a sphere or something it is. There's a different measure that actually is called sphericity. So that's based off of for a sphere of some given volume, what is its surface area? Let's compare that to the surface area of given region. So both of those are about on a coarse level, if the thing is spread or has texture or other properties or being relatively kind of squished together. And if the idea is, are those things that a subcortical structure is changing in as a function of aging? So let's say, is the thalamus, there are thalamus changes in volume. Is the thalamus becoming more, again, kind of compact and squished together? Or what's happening apart from those volumetric effects? How is the shape changing, given that we know, well, wherever we draw a segmentation and say, this is thalamus or hippocampus or whichever sub subcortical region we're looking at, on the other side of the boundary is other tissue, or a worst case, a ventricle, but there's something there. So those boundaries must be changing. And effectively, that's the shape of the structure in addition to those volumetric effects. I also looked at a measure of long axis curvature. So effectively for structures that I, I, I took the furthest points on them and made a line that goes from one to the other through the medians of the structure and tried to see like how much does it arc relative to if you just connect the, the endpoints together and effectively be like a tube. And the other one I had looked at was also surface texture where I effectively made a smooth version and see how that surface area compares to the higher resolution kind of um, surface of that structure to see how much we lost by kind of smoothing it out, which gives us a measure of kind of roughness or bumpiness of the structure. So I looked at all four of those in relation to aging for the subcortical structures that had the most um, improvement relative to, uh, for fractal density relative to volume. And the best of these actually was the ratio of surface area to volume, which is Otherwise, I would say the least interesting of these, but it's telling us that's at least in the specific case there, it's more about these relatively coarse measures that in, in terms of shape related differences that fractal dimensionality is giving us something. But, but if I took all four of these and add them to volume and do a multiple regression using all of that, fractal dimensionality gave hardly anything beyond these. So at least in that sense of isolating what is fractal dimensionality capturing that these that in addition to volume, these did do a good job of filling up that difference. Like I'm obviously adding a whole bunch more predictors, but with the aside of more predictors in the data set, I did do this analysis in two different data sets and looked at it as a kind of replication analysis and it generally was consistent. Um, and each data set was in the range of three, 400-ish from 18 to 80s um, across the adult lifespan. So that's at least maybe some insight in terms of with some cortical, what you can see. And again, if you're interested, can look into further. For the focus here, again, my thought was to look at the cortex. And those measures that I just described don't easily map onto the cortex. I think they made sense in the relative context of subcortical structures that kind of are more compact and like obviously have some shape related properties to the boundaries of what is that region and what is not. But folding is complicated and effectively this is also a hollowed out structure technically because I'm just looking at cortical gray matter. I'm not considering the white matter and subcortical inside of the brain at the same time. So how do we measure some things here? So one of the things that, I, that I've been working on recently, so this is literally the same slide I showed you earlier, but again, um, is looking at gyrification and how that changes with age. And especially as I've given talks on some of this, this is the thing that I think like, how does that actually work? So this is cross-sectional data. So that's a caveat to this result. And all of the papers prior to 
the one that I'm about to tell you that, that just got published recently, have only looked at, at gyrification differences in relation to age cross-sectionally. But what does it actually mean if this thing is trending downwards? Well, I, the idea is that even though it is to some degree a weak effect, it is trending downwards and it's been shown often enough and there is a topography to it, but what is that all about? So I decided to look at longitudinal changes in gyrification. So here I use 280 healthy adults from the OASIS-3 data set. I don't know if it's in, I don't have the actual age range here, but I believe it's roughly 45-ish to 90 is the first data point to last data point in terms of overall what we're working with here. It is technically in a, an accelerated longitudinal data set because people starting at different ages. In a few slides, they'll show you a scatter plot of, of their actual ages, and then you'll see that come up for yourself. Um, relative to this OASA 3 data set, which is actually quite a bit larger, it, as it does, for instance, include MCI and Alzheimer's patients as well. Um, my constraints were focusing on those that were healthy. I have this little squiggly that I did allow some data points to be below an MMSC of 25 if a later point data point was above it. I think that only applied to two participants. Um, but that is technically there are some that are below the 25, but a few months later on another clinical assessment, the score was higher again. Um, so I had to have at least two scans, otherwise you can't do anything longitudinal. And I also needed to have at least three years from first to last, just so I had a, an actual interval to look at. So in the actual data sets, we have a minimum of three because I set that to be true. And we did have data sets, like some participants that had up to 10 years from first to last scan on average is a little bit above five. And there's a whole lot of scans that get in there. If I had two from the same session, I averaged their numbers in terms of more of a trying to get higher reliability when possible. So gyrification is, was the primary measure here. So this is a different visualization for the same thing as earlier. We take our T1, we trace out the cortical gray matter boundary on, on this side, just the between gray matter and CSF, make our smooth surface around it and compare the areas of the two. For this particular individual, it's very close close to three, but not quite. And here I'll effectively be showing you four scatter plots as separate panels. Um, that's only because if I put them all in one, it, you can't really tell any patterns. So I grouped the data in terms of how many sessions I had. So you can kind of see trends. I did have an initial version where all of this was effectively overlaid and it just looks like a mess. But here you can quite reliably see that gyrification trends downward across years. There are some odd little bounces things, but those are technically within error estimates based on other analyses of test retest reliability. So there is, it's not fully an accurate measure, but it generally does trend downwards and effectively just some people start at a higher Y-intercept of sorts for the gyrification than others. Why that is, is a whole other research question. But across the longitudinal data set, we're seeing that it actually goes downwards. So that was reassuring. That hasn't been shown before. And then the question gets into what's, what's actually happening. Can we interpret that a bit further? Before I go into the interpreting a bit further, I did also measure on the whole brain level fractal dimensionality, and that also trends downwards. Um, but gyrification did a pretty good job of explaining the data also in the prior slide, considering that we had the multiple time points per person. So we could actually have slopes within subject rather than just aggregating across the full sample and looking at the off axis variability otherwise. So we first just look vertex wise, which is to some degree a more conventional approach apart from just doing whole brain. We can see that the most folded part is effectively related to the insula. That might be kind of a boring figure, but I thought it was reassuring to show. And you can see that the result is kind of quite smooth there in terms of the topography of it. More, more importantly, kind of more interestingly, is the lower panel, panel B here, where effectively I did vertex-wise uh, regression relative to age across all of my longitudinal kind of data to see how well each of those eight, like each vertex is affected as a function of age. 
and then we can see a much more continuous distribution, but effectively, as had been shown prior, that it is kind of primarily in the parietal lobe and somewhat looks a little bit more in terms of like sensory motor kind of region, but does match well enough to prior research. Here, the main thing that I was trying to figure out is what is a better approach to try and look at how this might change with age that apart from, I can try making like an animation or of the folding pattern, but that'll be still overly dominated by the just overall folding differences and well, folding relative heterogeneity with the insula. So when I, when I was looking back at, at early papers of gyrification, I came across this figure here. So this is from a paper from 1988. So quite a few decades ago now. And here they didn't have, they weren't looking with neuroimaging because that wasn't the thing yet. So instead they took sections of, of the brain ex vivo and looked at those sections and looked at the gyrification for each of them and made a plot from anterior, posterior kind of, of what is the gyrification of that section. So I thought I would, Kind of inspired by that, I'll try using that as a summary statistic kind of approach. So instead of just looking at whole brain gyrification or vertex wise, this is giving me something kind of in the middle where I'm collapsing whole brain, well, just overall kind of gyrification into a single dimension as opposed to a single data point or the overall surface map. So the approach here was to take the individual brains and I basically just took two from the data set as examples here. Compute their local gyrification, effectively the kind of heat map thing that I had shown earlier of overall gyrification, but on an inflated surface of their own brain first. Then register that to the common surface that FreeSurfer uses. And then through that, I can take sections that are now adjusted to be in the same kind of space. There is still more Sections can affect each other because there is spatial smoothing that happens across the anterior posterior gradient, unlike the original paper I'm kind of modeling this after. But otherwise, the approach is to get a gyrification smooth thing that's more anterior posterior wise. And for these two individuals, that's what it would look like. And I'm not really going to flip back and forth with the prior slide, but it looked kind of conceptually close enough. Um, so yeah, the idea is from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, you can see where there's relatively more or less folding just across this one dimension now. If you average that across all of the people in the sample, this is the line thing that you'll get. And I also use my somewhat adjusted low bar mapping of what regions are what lobes, but also including the insulin central sulcus to help get some landmarks to help in interpreting this, but that's then shown um, just above the, the x-axis there to, again, help with interpreting. So then I could start looking at aging effects in, in this measure. So that also is a novel thing. And here it's effectively a heat map where more towards kind of yellowish is more folding and the dark blues are less folding. So we can see that this spike that's kind of midway through the isola does come up as the kind of yellow band that's around 65-ish on the anterior posterior gradient. So that is our x-axis. And I'm only using data here from the 50 to 80 year old section of data as shown in the right panel where I basically am plotting how much MRI data I have for each age. So that's MRI sessions with the y-axis being age over here. But yeah, you can see that spike that's midway through the insula and the kind of troughs on both sides of it, and otherwise a large slopier peak that goes with the parietal lobe. That might be a little bit hard to interpret. So I also just tried plotting for specific ages, so let's say 50, 60, 70, 80, based on that overall distribution. Now I can see how those would look. Honestly, I was hoping for a difference across the age that was somewhat more interesting somehow, more of a change of the, in the distribution shape rather than a relative scaling that some peaks are more affected than others. Um, but that was the overall idea of, of the analysis still. So that still led me to, okay, what's actually happening with gyrification and aging? I have some more insight, but not that much more than what I already had from just looking at the surface analysis. 
So the other approach that I then tried was, OK, let's so look back at the brains again. So here's two particular individuals. One of them has the eight-year interval at the top, starting from 57 years old. And the one below has a nine-year interval, but they're starting at their 80s. And the point was to look at a relatively kind of consistent slice for, well, just really for all of them, um, but especially within brain, within individual, to see what is the actual brain structure changing as you look across excessive years. And you can kind of see it in the surface, but only kind of. The whole brain gyrification, which is the GI value just below, does trend downwards as expected at, at the rates that you'd expect from the overall slope from the distribution. But when you start looking at it, really, it seems to be something with the sulcal prominence. So at least kind of by visual inspection, we need a measure of sulcal properties. So there are some toolboxes that do measure sulcal morphology, but I wanted it to be kind of based off of FreeSurfer's own atlases and landmarks, even though that actually wasn't relevant to this project. So a few years ago, I did make a toolbox called CalcSulc, just like the other one's called CalcFD, that looks at, for a specific set of cells I using the Destro Atlas of FreeSurfer, these are the cells that I get a, a label for and are contiguous because a cell sci, both in free surfer and in the real world, can have the same label without being fully connected. You could have a separate patch that you label as the same cell sci, and I don't know, at, at least width gets complicated to measure if it's not one specific patch of vertices. Um, depth you could still do, but I still kind of decided that the toolbox just doesn't do it unless it can do both reliably. So I measured cell width and depth for the set of cell site using a toolbox I developed previously. And just to kind of give you some idea, I guess this is probably a different 28 year old than I showed earlier, but these are the ones I had used in the figure in that paper. But these are the cell site that we are looking at. Um, for the sake of these analysis, I effectively, I guess it's eight cell side, but there's two hemispheres. So 16 estimates of width and depth of cell site. And I have found in this paper and otherwise, that if you just average across all of them, that average cell width and depth is more strongly correlated with age than any specific cell size is, probably because it improves reliability of the estimates. So I took that approach of averaging across those 16 cell size width and depth and see how that relates to gyrification on the, on the global level. So I did a mediation analysis there, and age effects on gyrification were largely explained by I guess particularly the cell depth effects here. Age does have a strong effect on cell width, but that manifests relatively lesser in terms of the overall gyrification estimate. So at least this is giving us maybe a little bit of progress in terms of understanding a mechanism. At the very least, I feel like I shifted the question a bit. So it's less about age-related changes in gyrification. And now the question is a bit more, why is age affecting cell prominence in terms of the width and depth? which maybe is progress. Um, but the really is that's, that's how far I got relative to that paper and, and my own line of thinking. So if you have any thoughts on, on why that would change with age, then I'm, I'd be happy to discuss that and figure out ways to measure that better. But at least that's, that's where we're at so far. Um, so that's the end for talking about that study. As a brief aside, uh, one paper I've been working on recently is to look at an overview of what, what different open access data sets exist and what are some good examples of things that have been done using them. So effectively, what have other people done using data sets like HCP and OASIS and CAMCAN and the variety of, of, I guess those are the more popular ones, but dozens of other open access data sets that have sample sizes in the hundreds or otherwise might have very small sample sizes, but scan the same person for dozens of sessions. So the preprints, which I need to update very, very soon, um, but that paper should be also coming out soon in neuroinformatics and we'll tell you more about it. effectively kind of designed to be a primer in terms of, I want to use open access neuroimaging data, what's been done, what are some ideas of what, what I could do, what are some considerations in terms of thinking about how the data sets were collected. This is written to be kind of a starting point for for doing that sort of research. Some of the current directions of what I'm working on 
since the things I told you about are things that are kind of more on the finished side, is looking more at the individual differences in, in cognition and how that relates to brain structure. So things like cognitive reserve and genetic risk factors like APOE and how that might relate to differences in brain structure, even let's say in healthy individuals and young adults. Um, doing some work with patient samples, particularly interested in dementias. Again, my background is in memory, so that also kind of could cross over here rather than just being an orthogonal line of research. Um, through collaborations, I have been looking at a variety of other samples, and there is some work that I've published already with anorexia and some other that's yet under review. I think it's one of the interesting things that I found there is unlike, let's say, with dementia, this is something that people can recover from. So we can also see kind of how does brain structure kind of return to normal either longitudinally or just in a sample of individuals that are in a recovering stage of anorexia rather than in its kind of in the in the more severe stage of it. And also doing some work looking at how does age affect brain structure, but in non-human primates. So earlier I, I kind of was showing the logos at least of some data sets that use chimpanzees or macaques or other non-human primates and seeing how those results might compare here. In terms of some kind of summary messages. So age differences in brain structure aren't just all volumetric. We should also think about the shape of the structures and how that might help us understand what's happening, at least with aging. There's many ways to measure the shape related properties and they can each have some unique aspects in terms of where they're useful in trying to understand things or at least might have more sensitivity as a measure. And I think it is worth kind of having some caution when studying cortical brain activity in terms of how do you normalize for these variability in interindividual variability in brain structure. And that at least one approach that kind of gets around that in some ways is work that's focused on a much smaller sample of participants, but lots of data from them. And then you can map it onto the individual cortical surface and then not have to deal as much with kind of averaging and generalization in that sense. And be kind of accommodating to that individual variability. So that's all for the slides. So if there are any other questions, then I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Chris. It's a really interesting talk. I have, um, I have some more questions about this idea of gyrification, age-related gyrification, because in my mind, you know, the way, when I think of gyrification, I think of kind of classic Pascal Rakic papers, right? And, and that it's really a reflection of the cortical expansion uh, sure. yeah. in the neurodevelopmental period and uh, especially in utero. Um, and then the folding is kind of done as a means of accommodating the rapid expansion of the cortex. Um, so then when I, when I see your work kind of the, with these age-related changes, uh, you know, the thing that that strikes me is that, you know, you, and, and you mentioned it as well and you showed it really nicely is that you see this kind of increase in the intracellular space as, an, as a function of age, right? Mm -hmm. um, which just may be the neurogenerative process at play, right? So, you know, you, you're not, you know, unlikely to lose, to really lose any, any total surface area as you age, uh, but you will lose volume sure. and you will. Yeah, lose I guess that, that again, with those are the conventional measures have been studied quite a bit and surface area is generally not age affected, at least not on a cohort level, like in an aggregate, but thickness is where it is. So surface area then in principle, gyrification should be relatively stable, but obviously gyrification trends downwards, even though surface area is not. Which so is, I guess a separate other confusing part. So, so, so the question I have, I guess, is if cortical volume is really the reflection of the product of area right. and thickness, Yes. And how related are your folding measures to the overall thickness? I don't think gyrification, like, I'm sure I've tested gyrification with thickness and they're not that related. Actually, I have a, I have a, or as, as, as one of my, on the wall that actually answers this thickness and they're basically not correlated. They're I have not a correlated. thing on the wall for a paper that's half written as a reminder to finish writing it. That no. actually is a, a giant scatter plot of lots of different cortical measures with each other. So I just looked on my like pyramid or like triangle of correlation, and yeah, it's basically not correlated. And what about and 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 uh, someone's chatting this to me now in, in another Slack session? But like, uh, what about the underlying white matter loss? Uh, how much is it related to that? I have no idea. 
I, I just I haven't looked into that yet. Yeah, so that might be an interesting thing because I feel like you know it's nice to have these different measures. And as someone who who trades in this, I, I definitely would agree. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it would be useful to see kind of you know its inter-brain relationship, as it were. Sure. Yeah. So I, I completely agree that they're good questions. It's more of a matter of well, I started with it being useful for aging at all. And then the later question is trying to interpret it a bit more, at least within that context. And there's just a lot of things to, that are worth trying, at least with some rank order of priority, but there's a lot we don't know yet. Yep. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, I, I guess like one thing I kind of, I haven't really, I've been thinking about this, but I, I don't really know how to articulate it really well, but okay. I guess it seems like you have a, like a lot of like interesting different metrics that we can use to understand the brain. I was wondering if you have any ideas on like how we can like holistically look at it while also like switching between the different metrics. Um, Cause like, I'm just thinking like, it'd be really cool to see like, oh, like, I mean, as you sort of said, like, you know, there's like differences in fractal, fractal dimensionality versus, you know, gyrification in different regions. But how do you like, theoretically, how do you decide like what approach to take or like in terms of like which metric, specific metric to use versus like just using all of it, but then like trying to come up with like a coherent narrative of like why you chose, chose like all of them, for example. Well, at least all of them is more of, we don't know. So we tried, we measure all the things and looked at like, then you have the like dimensionality reduction kind of problem, but right. then you, that might even give you some insight in terms of, let's say in terms of thickness and gyrification for fractal dimensionality. If you did that region wise, which regions do they relatively give? Like if you, let's say use thickness and like did them in that order, thickness, gyrification, fractal dimensionality and say, okay, which cases do you get meaningfully additional variability explain which ones you don't. Mm. So it, I guess really I'd say it depends on what your research question is. So like with, with one paper that I kind of vaguely mentioned about anorexia, we only looked at fractal dimensionality in that paper. Other studies have looked at thickness and gyrification. In, one, in a later paper kind of in that line that isn't published yet, we're looking at this kind of anterior posterior gradient and gyrification and looking at cell morphology then too. Mm -hmm. But part of it is what are you trying to study? If it's just how does structure relate to some sort of inter-individual difference, then in principle, then the question either is about a specific measure or it's about all the measures depends on how you pose the research question mm. yeah so yeah I'd say they're all valid it's just more about thinking about what do you what what is the question you're actually trying to answer what right. is the most specific or sensitive measure so for instance that slide that i showed with the alzheimer's data like okay this one has a higher coins d and the better separation of distributions then you then that that's a result in itself and that was one of the later kind of figures in that paper so that is a result if it's more about how does that relate to something else or why is it true that's a different question and that takes a different analysis approach hmm. right yeah that's that's a really yeah interesting point but also like i i wonder like if you could somehow calculate the difference between different measures as well to see like how variable or how variable the different measures are across the, the different metrics. Do you think that would be um, informative? Well, I guess for some of the analyses, you probably need to normalize them anyway. So like fractal dimensionality is in a very narrow range from, I guess, see how far back I'd have to go to find that. But like I show them as a giant scatter plot, but the y-axis have to be different because they're just different kinds of measures. So mm -hmm. for fractal demand, Actually, this works because it shows different things at the same time. So fractal dimensionality is over here. They're showing it from 2.58 to 2.64. So that's a range of 0 0.06. Whereas this is a range of almost 0.5 or so. Right. And this is a range of 0.6. I guess that's thickness and gyrification are on a common scale there. But uh, depending on your goal, you probably should like z-score them or percentile range to do some sort of scaling to make, like if you're going to put them in a regression so that their weights don't effectively yeah, you standardize it so it's more like a beta than in their own original units. 
but because otherwise it's also a little bit of a mess to figure it even like plotting it comes up so again kind of goes back to what's the real question because they're on different scales they're in their own different units mm -hmm. so what you if you want to do something like effectively with the the correlation see how much off axis variability there is that's a specific measure that or you could like look at yeah you could, you could look effectively it's the residuals is the off axis variability anyway so you could look at the relative proportion between those two like the real unit to the residuals and get some other kind of sensitivity measure but really that's that's a different research question than if you're trying to see that's an age effect or something right right okay great thank you um, okay, things, so things we can do, lots of papers that have not been done. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Various different approaches. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we're, we're time. Thank you so much for yeah, um, your presentation. Well, thank you all end. for coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I guess next week we'll have our, our next lecture, but yeah, thank you.